The component to which I contribute is the biological or the physiological side. I'm very aware that there are a number of other domains that impact on this debate. <clears throat> I try not to step out of my lane, as it were, and I stick very much to the biological. And so I do have a presentation that I want to share with you. Um, the issues, almost by way of disclosure, the issues here are deep and wide. And I don't have the time to go deep and wide on this subject. So I will apologize in advance for seemingly rushing through this, but I'm more than happy to take questions where I skim over things and even to discuss this beyond this meeting. Um, I'm available at any time really to discuss and talk. I think the more we speak, the better. So feel free to ask either now or in the future. So when we tackle this issue um, from a biological perspective, it makes, and I, and I don't mean to talk down to anyone, I don't mean to assume too much either. So forgive me if this is oversimplistic, but at the most basic level, imagine an alien, let's call him a Martian. When I was young, there was a character called Marvin the Martian on television. Let's assume that Marvin the Martian came to Earth and observed human sporting behavior for the first time. And he makes some observations and says the following is, why do you compete in different categories? I noticed that you have two gold medals in the Olympic 100 meters, two Wimbledon singles titles, two football world cups. And so that's a legitimate question with which to start on this debate. Now, the answer to Marvin on this particular question is that actually, if he watches enough sport, he will see that we have different categories in many different ways. So for example, if Mar Marvin spent some time watching boxing or learning about boxing, he would soon discover that three of the greatest boxers in the history of the world are Muhammad Ali, Roy Jones Jr. and Floyd Mayweather. But they don't ever fight against one another. They've been categorized because they are quite different with respect to their size and their height. And so forgive me for using the metric system, but there is a, a almost 40 kilogram difference between Ali, who is the heaviest, and Mayweather, who is the lightest of these three. And there's a difference in height as well. And so before we answer Marvin the Martian's question about sex in sport, we can use weight as an illustration and ask this question is, what are we trying to reward in boxing? And the answer is that what we're trying to reward in boxing is a combination of skill, speed, hand-eye coordination, balance, agility, endurance, strength, and power. And if we didn't have weight categories, then the important elements of boxing, all those attributes that I've just listed, would be completely overwhelmed by size, and the end result would be that the best boxes would be the biggest boxes. That's not to say that a smaller boxer can't beat a bigger one. Roy Jones Jr. would beat many heavyweights because he's exceptional, but the most exceptional heavyweight is going to be better than exceptional middleweight, who is better than an exceptional lightweight. And so the category that we've created for weight ensures that we can reward the attributes that truly matter. And so coming back to Marvin's question, we point out that we do that for weight because otherwise size and bulk would overwhelm X, where X are the elements that we wish to reward. We do that for age because otherwise biological development and maturity would overwhelm the attributes that matter. And we do it in the Paralympics for disability category where relative ability would otherwise overwhelm X. We also do it to some extent through law. We prevent athletes from doping. So we have, in theory, clean sport. It doesn't always work, of course. People cheat that system, just as they cheat the system around disability categories. There are classification scandals at every single Olympic or Paralympic Games. But the point that I'm trying to make is that categories ensure fairness in sport. They ensure equal opportunity and a degree of equity before the gun goes off, before the athlete walks onto the field. And then what we recognize is that with each of these, with weight, with age, and with disability category, we separate by biological sex. Because as much as these attributes matter, biological sex is the single most important determinant of athletic performance that we know of. It is so overwhelming that if we did not have a category for athletes who are female, we would have no females in elite sport. And so that's the point. So we can compare, for instance, Wade for Nickak, who's the South African world record holder in the 400, and Shawna Milawibo, who's the Olympic champion in the 400, and we will find that numbers-wise, they are the same. Performance-wise, they are very different. That's the difference that biological sex makes. Now, these two athletes are equally exceptional. There is nothing different about their ability. 
but the stopwatch is different because biology must be recognized as being different. So there's this paradox almost where women's sport actually exists as a category so that we can celebrate champions like Katie Ledecky, like Serena Williams, like Shauna Malawiba, Elaine thompson Harry, Portia Woodman's a rugby player, Morgan, the football, Abby Morgan. So we recognize their equality and their exceptionalism only because we accept the biological difference. That's the start point to this debate. So Marvin Amasha now understands that. He says, well, is the difference in performance between men and women large enough that we require separate categories? Persuade me. So let me try and do that. Now, the first thing is that as a physiologist, performance is my outcome. I can measure in a laboratory half a dozen things, hundreds of things, actually, if I'm, if I'm honest, hundreds of different things that together create the final performance ability. And most of those attributes are, are related in some way, either very strongly or weakly, to what we call the secondary sex characteristics. So these are not when we talk about primary sex characteristics, we're talking about reproductive function. Secondary sex characteristics are those characteristics that differentiate male and female, but that are not directly involved in reproductive function. So, for example, with respect to sport, we could put height or mass or strength, muscle mass, for example, between males and females. And what we get is generally two normal curves where we have female normal curve and male with some degree of overlap. Now, this pattern of two bimodal, what's called a bimodal distribution, is exactly what you would predict in the event of binary sex, which is to say two categories. So some people in this debate, and this is again somewhat philosophical, have taken this bimodal distribution and argued that the overlap, for instance, where we see many women are taller or heavier than many men, is an indication that there is a spectrum. It would be true to say that there is a spectrum of secondary sex characteristics, but the determinant of this is actually binary sex as a, as an, as a let's call it the root cause of what we see here. So the overlap in attribute X, irrespective of what it is, does not disprove binary sex, just in the same way that a small dog is not a rabbit. We have dogs and rabbits who, for whom mass or size, it have significant overlap, but we would never make the mistake of assuming that that's a spectrum in the case of being a dogget. And for this, I want to credit Emma Hilton, who goes by fond of Beatles on Twitter, and who has been a very, very influential voice in this debate, if you are interested in following someone new. So the point that I'm trying to make here is that there is a separation of these secondary sex characteristics that creates the performance differences. So what does that look like on Earth? for the benefit of Marvin the Martian. So this is an example of height for men and women, and you will see typically the two curves that I've just shown you. We have an 8% difference in the means and medians. So the average man is 8% taller than the average woman. The tallest man is 8% taller than the tallest female, male and female. But we also recognize that the tallest 5% of females are taller than the typical man. That's the overlap argument once again. So you will find women who are taller than men, females who are taller than males. But when that happens, you know that what you're dealing with is a relatively tall female compared to a relatively short male. It's not a like-for-like -like comparison. Now, if I'm laboring the point, it's because later on, we will be able to make the same statement for athletic performance, which is to say, you will find females who are stronger, faster, can jump higher and swim faster than many males. But when you have that, what you are looking at is an exceptional female, Katie Ledecky, compared to a relatively unexceptional male performer. And that's the issue that sport is grappling with when it comes to fairness. We'll get to that in a moment. Now, we know that in sport, these differences are exaggerated. So, for instance, this is in elite rugby, which is where I do most of my work now. And that's what, the, that's what the curves look like. You'll recall that in the general population, the difference between the average male and female is about 8 to 10%. In the elite rugby population, it's 40%. And in fact, the heaviest 2% of women and females is actually lighter than the typical male. And the woman's median, which is the typical female, is lighter than the lightest 1% of all males. So... In rugby, for instance, where mass is very important, there is, whilst not total separation, 
much less overlap than we would see in other domains. And the typical difference is 41%. So elite training tends to exaggerate these biological differences. What does that mean for performance? Now, it's not all about mass. It's about all sorts of things that we will shortly learn about. But these are the actual performances by age of boys shown in the broken gray lines and girls shown in the solid black lines from the age of 11 up to 18. And what you will notice with respect to 60 meter time, long jump performance, 800 meter time and high jump is that as we go through our teenage years and puberty happens at the beginning of this period, the performance differences between girls and boys gets larger and larger and larger. So at the age of 11, they are fairly similarly matched, not quite, but close. By 14, a significant gap has appeared. And by 18, it is quite large indeed. And so those percentage differences look as follows. Less than 5%. And then something changes. Now, those of you who are parents, so boys and girls, will understand what changes. It's a lot more than sports performance, of course. But this is the watershed of puberty. And it brings with it significant biological developments that change performance in humans. By the time we reach adulthood, we see very large differences. This is an example, and I apologize for the quality, but this is an example for hand grip strength, where once again, you see very small differences from the age of five all the way up to 12, and then suddenly those differences appear. And by the time we get to 19 years of age, the difference is about 40 kilograms where the males are producing about 100. So that's a 40% difference that emerges. And the key point is the timing of that separation. Put that in a parking lot because we will come to it. Then when we get to adulthood, this is what we find. So again, this is hand grip strength, which has been measured in thousands of adults, males and females. And what you discover is that the difference between males shown in blue and females in red is about 65%. So in other words, males have 65% more strength in their grips than females do. And in fact, the best performing females are about as strong as the bottom third of males. So that's how big that difference is. Now, where this is all headed with respect to sport is what actually happens in elite athletes. What actually happens when we watch an Olympic Games or an elite sports competition. In fact, let me not limit this to elite. If you watch NCAAs, if you watch a high school sports event at your, in your local community, you will see the same thing play out. We have a roughly 12% difference between males and females across the board in running events. This is running events. So from the 100 all the way to the marathon, including high jump and long jump, we see the oldest female record is in the 800. The narrowest margins we see is 9.5% in the 100. The overall difference is 12%. Now, and, and just, just to put that into perspective, this 10.2% gap between the best male and the best female in history is so large that every single year, about 600 males fit into that space. In other words, the best female in history would be ranked about 600 every year among males. And if we go all time, it's outside the top 6,000. I couldn't find a database that went low enough to find where that performance would be ranked. Now, when, when we come to this and we say, well, it's a 10% difference, I want to make you or help understand how big a difference that is. And to do that, I want to share with you very quickly, this is 20 seconds worth of video. It comes from the 2019 World Championships that were held in Doha. And there is an event which is a four by 400 mixed relay, two male, two female. And what happened in this particular race is that Poland started with their two men. Everyone else goes uh, female, female, male, male. And so by the time the last leg came around, Poland had a significant lead over the rest of the field. And I'm showing you what happened over the first 150 meters of the final leg. So just bear with us. Oh, sorry, that's my bad. Yeah, just Bear with me here. So here's the changeover, and you'll see the Polish oh, athlete. The comes over to the change. You don't need sound for this. The Polish athlete comes in. You can see the lead they've built up by virtue of going with two males. And then the female athlete, sorry, I've got the wrong one. The female athlete changes over, and here we now go to the final leg. And you'll see this, the margin that she takes the baton in the lead. 
There's a long shot now, which gives you good perspective. So this is with 400 meters to go in a race. And here, this is what this is what you're dealing with, right? So that's the margin of the lead at the takeover. It's already been eroded to some degree. I want you to watch the speed with which this male athlete passes the Polish athlete and put into your minds that this is what 12% looks like. I want to make a point that this Polish athlete made the finals of the Olympic Games in Tokyo 2021. So she is one of the best seven or eight athletes in the world. This is an elite female at the top of her own game. And that's what it looks like when you have a 12% difference between competitors. We're so accustomed to seeing athletes win by a few percent and thinking that that's big, that we don't really appreciate. And the end result here is that having started with a 40 meter lead, she ends up losing by about 30 meters. <laughs> compared to the person in the team that's fourth. Now that's, that's what 12% that's what looks like. So that is why this is a relevant discussion because the point is that the differences between male and female, while 10%, 12% sound small, they are so large that if we didn't have a category for females, we would not see females in elite sport. That's the reality. So the conceptual problem facing sport is that many men outperform, sorry, many women outperform many men. We know that. The, that 400 meter athlete would beat almost every single male in your town, almost guaranteed. The problem we have is that any match level, many men outperform all women. That's the difference. That's the key point, right? And that difference is about 12% for running events. It's even larger for things like weightlifting. So I'll come to that in a moment. But one final visual on this is that every single one of these blue dots here represents a performance by a male athlete in the 400 in 2017. So in one year, that's what they run. The world record, incidentally, is 43.03, set in 2016. So the best performer that year was a little bit slower than that. The, the dark blue dots are junior males. So that's males 18 and, and younger and 20 and younger. And it's by the time you get here that you see the first female performances emerge. They belong to Alison Felix and they belong to Sonia Richards Ross. Sonia Richards Ross and Alison Felix and then Christina Rugovic. So every single dot there is a boy or man, male, adult man, who outperforms the best 400 meter runners we've seen in history. And that's a striking visualization of exactly how important biological sex is to performance. I'm going to skip that slide in the interest of time. When it comes to the upper body, the gaps are even larger. So in weightlifting, where we compete in categories of 55 kilograms, the best males are 30% stronger than the best females. At 69 kilograms, the best males are lifting 30% more than the best females. And in the open category, it's a almost 40% difference in absolute terms between the best male and female. So whether it's running speed, whether it's upper body strength, whether it's lower body strength, we know that for power, the difference is about 30 to 40%. We know that for punching ability, which is a complex action that involves upper body rotation and force generation, it's about 160% difference for males compared to females. And so those biological differences are so large that without the quote unquote protection of a separate category, those who do not have biological male advantages would disappear from sport entirely, most sports. There are one or two exceptions. So now Marvin wants to understand why do they differ so much? And the answer is, and I alluded to this earlier when I showed you, is, is evident here in the timing. This difference between, in this case, boys and girls, and what we see in adults later in life coincides with puberty, which is when we know that the male hormone testosterone levels increase significantly in males, but not in females. And so again, we go backwards from performance. We recognize that performance is a function of the biological attributes. And those biological attributes are significantly changed by a category of hormones that are called androgens. Now this word andro means male and gen means creation. So this word literally means male creating hormones. And they include testosterone and other family members, which we won't ne necessarily get into, we, we might. But testosterone is therefore the main driver of these emergent differences between males and females. 
Now, testosterone is one of the few variables that is completely separated between male and female in the absence of pathology. So the female range is typically thought to be from 0.5 to 3. 99% of all females have a testosterone level below 3. 99.9% .9 of all females have a testosterone level below 5. And 99.99, which is to say 1 in 10,000 doesn't, has a testosterone below 10. The opposite is true for males. From 10 up is where we will find healthy males. There is a range between them, between 3 and 10, which is basically pathological. So, for instance, in the presence of tumors, in the presence of males who have hypogonadism, their testosterone falls. In the context of sport, doping can cause testosterone levels to fall in males or go up in females. And that can cause athletes to enter this, this highlighted red range. But in healthy individuals, there is total separation between the testosterone levels of male and female. And that is an important concept to bear in mind. It is that testosterone that drives a range of differences from body composition. Muscle mass is higher in males. Muscle strength is higher. I've shown you data on that. Bone and skeleton is different. The length of the bones, the, the relative strength and the density of the bones, the tendons, VO2 max values, respiratory function and cardiovascular function. Every system you can think of is affected by testosterone in ways that almost without exception have impacts on performance ability in sport. And so what we then see is that there's no single variables, but a system, the whole biological system is modified by these androgens. And so coming back to our earlier definition, women's sport exists so that we can reward champions like Ledecky, Williams, Miller, Weber, Thompson. It achieves this objective by excluding the effects of androgens on biology and performance. That's what the point of the category is from the perspective of the biologist. So how has sport tried to resolve the issue in the past? And the issue here, of course, is, is transgender women participating in women's sport. Now, if you go back, and this is a short history lesson with which I wanna then try and conclude, is in 2015, the authority said the following in a policy. The, the policy goes all the way back to 2003, but I just wanted to highlight this. This was the International Olympic Committee who say in their policy that the overriding sporting objective is and remains the guarantee of fair competition. So they have in a sense told us that the number one priority, that's how I interpret this to, to mean, what I interpret this to mean, the overriding number one objective is and remains the guarantee of fair competition. What they also say, and this is where things get confusing, is that it is necessary insofar as possible to ensure that trans athletes are not excluded from the opportunity to participate in sport. Now, there is, and I think most of you recognize, this is controversial because of this tension. There is a tension between the desire to allow trans women, particularly, to compete in women's sport and the desire of authorities to guarantee fair competition. Now, if you try and understand how the authorities develop their policy, this becomes quite important because their initial thinking was that if testosterone was the cause of the problem, in other words, if testosterone was the reason for male advantage in, in sport, and if women's sport was meant to exclude testosterone, then we could fix the issue by taking the testosterone away. That was the rationale that they used. And so in 2015, the policy said, as long as the athlete shows that their testosterone has been less than five, this was a proposal by the um, IOC, it was adopted by, for instance, World Athletics. For other sports, it remains 10. In the, in, for instance, in swimming, they've kept it at a concentration of 10. So now they're saying that as long as the athlete lowers their testosterone, then they can compete against women athletes because you've taken away the cause of the difference. They are quite clear in saying that legal recognition and surgical changes are not required. All that is required is lower testosterone. So in a sense, the whole transgender issue has been boiled down to lower your testosterone levels. Now, the sports authorities effectively have placed an all-in bet on testosterone reduction as the way to ensure fairness and safety. Their rationale being that if the source was T, then take it away and remove it. So the obvious question, which anyone should ask, ask at this point, including Marvin the Martian, is does the fix work? If you lower the testosterone, do we take away the advantage? Yes or no? It's a simple question. And in actual fact, the biology here is quite straightforward. And I want to share that with you. 
This was one of the first studies that was done. It shows you muscle area going across from left to right. This is a biological male, 46XY. That's a biological male before the suppression of testosterone. Taking testosterone suppressing drugs lowers their muscle area by 9%. The problem is that the initial difference was 30%. And so if you compare a 46XX, which is a biological female, to this individual, the trans woman has still got 16% more muscle than the biological female. So that suggests that more than half of this initial male versus female advantage is retained. That's the retention of advantage right there, even after testosterone is suppressed. There've been 12 other studies that have come out in the last decade or so that have looked at this. They find, for instance, the following. This is showing you hemoglobin levels. Now, hemoglobin, sorry, I'll go back. Hemoglobin is one variable that does respond rapidly. So here you see that the hemoglobin level in trans women drops quite quickly within four months of the onset of testosterone suppression. And it reaches levels that are quite similar to biological females. So hemoglobin is what we could call agile. It, it changes quite quickly. Muscle mass, muscle strength, and muscle area do not. So this is an example from a very well-conducted study in Sweden where they've looked at muscle area and radiological density. And what they find is that there's hardly any reduction in muscle area. It's only 4% such that it remains 26% higher than in females. So the suppression of testosterone reduces muscle size or area by 4%, but it remains 26% higher. Radiological density gives you an indication of the quality of the muscle, that changes by 2%. And there's a significant difference between a trans woman and biological female. This is muscle strength. They assessed it at the knee. And what you will notice, the key comparison is pre to post. So how much does it change as a consequence of suppressing testosterone? And the answer is hardly at all. In fact, in this particular study, not at all. There was no change. And so there is no statistical loss of muscle strength, even when testosterone is suppressed for up to 12 months. And that introduces us to this concept, concept where there's an asymmetry of testosterone. Once the effects of testosterone have been created through androgenization, most of them persist well beyond the presence of testosterone. So you can take the testosterone away, but it doesn't take the issue away, with the exception of hemoglobin. For skeleton, muscle, strength, and size, the differences persist beyond testosterone. So this is a table which you can read in a paper that's been published. I don't want to go through it now, or you can watch this presentation at your leisure and read about those 12 studies that have been done, which have shown this. And they've shown that the biological differences between males and females range from between 10 to 190%. And what testosterone suppression does is it changes them by between 0 and 10%. Now, the implication of that is quite clear. It means there is significant retained advantage. And so the choice that sports must make is that just like the IOC recognized, yes, we want fairness. Yes, we want inclusion. And in some sports, there's a safety consideration. So those are the three imperatives for sport. All the biological evidence we have suggest that we cannot achieve inclusion and fairness and safety at the same time. There is no compromise solution that maintains fairness and allows for inclusion. And so what that means is that inclusion happens at the expense of fairness. That is biological reality. And fairness can only be achieved if the boundary around women's sport is defended rigidly. That is unfortunately for those who wish to prioritize inclusion, the reality is that you would be doing so at the expense of fairness. And as long as, in my opinion, if you own that, at least it's an honest conversation, but you cannot achieve balance. Sport has to choose. And this requires that we recognize which of these things matters more. In the context of women's sport, which one matters more? And that's pretty much where I want to finish off. I was going to explain to you how world rugby reached its conclusions when it assessed that, but I think you have an idea of that. The point being that we cannot balance fairness and inclusion and safety at the same time. 
And so sport must make difficult choices. There was a time when it was thought that we could achieve all three, some kind of a, a Solomonic wisdom where we could almost cut the baby in half, as it were. That doesn't exist. We have to pick. And unfortunately, sports are going to have to decide whether the existence of a women's category for the purposes I've outlined matters, or does women's sport exist to facilitate inclusion based on identity? That is the decision they have to make. And I think on that note, I'll hand over to some others. That is a very good question and an important one because what's happened in the last year or two is that as people have recognized this biology that I've just shared with you, they've, they've tried to find subtle ways to achieve the same thing. Now, if we go from first principles, the performance differences between males and females ranges between 10%, as I showed you for running events, swimming events, cycling, all the way to 50% for strength events, particularly in the upper body. So this, the start difference between male and female is quite different. Then we also know that testosterone suppression changes certain systems more than others. I showed you that hemoglobin levels change almost completely. So hemoglobin goes from male to female levels. That's a complete reversal. Muscle mass and skeleton mass change by maybe one fifth of what the initial difference was. And so what people have now begun proposing is that if your sport has relatively small differences between male and female to begin with, and if you can achieve, and if your sport is reliant on cardiovascular function like hemoglobin, then you might be able to get away with a fairer outcome than something like weightlifting or boxing or an upper body strength event. Does that make sense? And so what they've started to do is, this, is to propose that on a sport by sport basis, you might be able to tilt the scales closer to fairness, whereas for some sports, that difference will persist and be enormous. Now, it's for the sports to decide, is there, a, is there a point at which it becomes fair enough or do we need it to be absolutely fair? I would argue that fair enough isn't good enough. <laughs> it needs to be absolutely fair. You have to be 100% confident that you've removed the advantage before you can allow because imagine imagine arguing the other way and saying that some doping is okay as long as it doesn't help you too much you wouldn't do that it's fairness is absolute and it exists in the process it doesn't exist in the outcome so i i would reject that argument but that is the argument that many sports are now making and, and people in charge yeah. uh i, I don't Conceptually, yes, but by scale, I think it would be very, very difficult to know that you've achieved enough of a benefit from doping. So we know, for instance, from leaked materials from the Eastern European countries that the doping that they got gave those athletes between 10 and 20% performance improvements quite quickly in some instances, in some events. Can I put my finger on exactly what the relative advantage is when a trans woman transitions and retains advantage? No, that's the problem is that we can't balance the scales by adding testosterone on one side to try and make up for the fact that the other side retains the benefits of it because we can't, we can't get the titration right. So, so conceptually, yes, but the calibration would be almost impossible to achieve. But it does illustrate, I guess, to some degree, the dilemma is that you have to then compound the existence of testosterone on one side with the addition of testosterone to the other. Correct. That, that individual would have all the benefits of having undergone male, male puberty, androgenization that I explained without any intervention to remove that at all. So they are effectively competing in the wrong category. It, it, yes. And so what you've, I think what you've actually pointed to is that the only way to fix the first conceptual problem is to create a second conceptual problem. That's the reality. Because the moment you allow the, the very thing that women's sport is meant to exclude in, then the only way to fix it is to allow everyone to have that same benefit. Or you have to not allow it in the first place. So you're quite right. The sports authorities thought that they could take the testosterone away and fix the issue, but it doesn't work. And that's the reality is we've just realized that the, the fix, as it were, quote unquote, just doesn't work. And so now they're faced with a different choice.
Well, the, the, the mitigation, it's interesting. The, the moment you take the drugs, and I, the previous IC policy had an outline of exactly which drugs you take. I mean, you mentioned some of them a moment ago, uh, Donna, but there are a couple others as well, spironolactone and so forth. Those, those drugs generally bring the levels of testosterone down very low. So all the studies that have been published, those 12 that I mentioned, the, the testosterone level in those trans women is generally in the female range. And the point is that even when you bring the testosterone down into the female range, the legacy advantages, the legacy differences in biological systems persist despite low testosterone. So in actual fact, a female who dopes wouldn't have to take much at all. Their testosterone levels would go high. But the point is that no amount of doping ever takes a female to male levels. We know this because the East Germans did this. They literally tried this <laughs> in the 1970s and 80s when there was no regulation around doping. The, the East German countries were giving their female athletes levels of male hormones so high that they were basically androgenized and their performances still did not reach the level of the best males. So, so, you, so you, cannot, you cannot turn a female into a male with doping and nor can you turn a male into a female by suppressing testosterone. The, the work that is done by testosterone during our lifetime up to the adulthood is so robust that you cannot undo it in either direction. So, so sorry, my, Vicky, that's, that's my understanding of Donna's question is almost that she's playing a sort of devil's advocate role and saying that yeah. you, you've almost, if, if we go back to the way, and again, I'm sorry if I'm framing it in, a, in an unfair way, but if the existence of women's sport is to exclude male hormones from it, and we allow some in on one side, then we could conceptually correct it by adding hormones on the other side, but then it's two wrongs to try and make yeah, it right. And absolutely. We end, up, we end up doing the, the a wrong thing. So, so Donna, just, I'm sorry if I wasn't clear, conceptually what you propose works, but we, it's, it's not plausible to do it because we, we don't know how to titrate so that we could actually have these two groups meet in the middle. It, so, so, so it's actually not possible, but conceptually it's an illustration of, of the issue. Yeah, sure. The, the, the studies, there were 13 of them in total and the best way to find them, there are two reviews that have been done. One was done by Joanna Harper um, and the other one was done by Hilton and Lundberg and they summarized those studies into tables and they will give you the numbers. It's in the, I think it's in the range of about 800 in total across 13 different studies. But I'll certainly provide references for those reviews and then people can go and uh, search for the, the, the source papers themselves, yes. I can, um, if you give me another hour, because what, okay. you're, what you're dealing with with those athletes, I'm, I'm not going to take an hour, don't panic. Um, what, what you're dealing with in those individuals is relatively rare differences of sex development. So in the normal course of things, and this, this goes back to sort of what you might have been taught in high school biology, is that your, your chromosome, either XX or XY, determines whether you have testes or gonads. So XY, male, develops testes. Those testes produce testosterone, and that testosterone triggers all the development I've shown you. Now, there are a couple of conditions where testosterone is produced, but it doesn't do its next function downstream, as it were, so that the effect of testosterone on the body isn't realized. And in Casta Semenya's case, and we, we know of a few others now from even last year's Olympics, what then happens is that they have XY, so male chromosomes, they have internal testes, they have very high circulating levels of testosterone, and they can use that testosterone effectively. So the, the condition she's got is where normally what happens is 5% of a male's testosterone is spun off and converted to another hormone called DHT. That's one of the family members I mentioned in the presentation. That DHT is responsible for the development of the primary sex organs, in other words, the genitalia. So in her case, she couldn't form the DHT and therefore the primary genitalia of a male. So she, she ends up with ambiguous or female genitalia, but with typical testosterone levels of within the male range, and she's able to use that testosterone. So at birth would be oftentimes identified as a girl, raised as such, 
And then when they reach puberty, because they're fully capable of using testosterone, the, the presentation becomes more apparent. Now, those are conceptually similar to trans individuals. Um, and so I would probably suggest they're covered by the same policy that, or the same principles I've spoken about. Where they are tricky is that there are medical and ethical issues around the governance and regulation. And I think sport messed up very badly on those but I don't want to go necessarily into those. As I said, I'm more than happy to take questions after this and explain all the detail to you about those. So, but that's an overview of what it is. Yeah, it's a good question. The, of, the, of the 12 or 13 studies that have been done, only two have gone beyond 12 months so far. Some of the others are continuing now, so it might in future add to that. Those studies generally show that most of the changes happen within the first six months. So if, for instance, there was a, let's say, 10% reduction, six or 7% of it happens within six months, then a couple of percent in the next few months, and the, the rest, the, the, the remaining muscle mass changes and so forth are almost level off beyond that. There was a very interesting study out of Kansas in 2021, where they looked at the military and they tracked over three years. And they found that the, let me just make sure I get this right, the running performance leveled off after two years of testosterone suppression. So that the changes happened over two years. So first year, large change, second year, small, and then it leveled off. And that push up and sit up performance continued to decline into the third year. So but those are the only two that give us any information in that regard. And, and did they ever reach, uh, are, are you still maintaining that there was a legacy advantage remaining? Yeah, and certainly in the running performance, the, the tricky thing in that particular study without going into major detail is that, you know, in the military, when you do push-ups and sit-ups, you, you aim for a target. You know, you have to do say 48 in a minute. And at some point those trans women would have changed the target. So when they were doing the push-up tests as men, <laughs> the target would have been 60 in a minute. And then at some point, because of their identity, the target changes to 45. And so the performance drops right off because the target changed. And so we don't actually know is the answer for that reason. <laughs> 